All right. Good morning. I warned Brian this morning. I can actually, I'll be actually, be, oh, he's ushering now. He's downstairs. But I can actually look upstairs this morning because it's not sunny, which is kind of inter- nice. Uh, it's going to be an interesting morning. You remember, remember that sermon where I was talking about, like, Jackie had got me a new wallet? You know, and, and you know, husbands, you get a new wallet and, and you don't use it for, like, years and years because you don't want to transition to the new one from the old one. I have bought a new Bible this week. So... So we'll see how that feels. It's, it definitely feels foreign, but it's still the Bible, so the good stuff is inside. Um, uh, just a warning, uh, I'm kind of calling an audible this morning on our confession of sins, so that's going to be a little bit different, and, and so just make sure you're paying attention uh, when we get to that in, in a short while here. And uh, I want to just say uh, thank you this morning, because it, it, I don't often think of it. I would maybe, I hope we don't take it for granted. We highlight our music often. But uh, thank you this morning to Jeanette and Steve and Renee, especially this morning as well, uh, for playing music for us. I say that because um, in a couple of weeks, circumstances will have them all busy. And so on the 29th, if anybody is interested in playing some special music, or if there's a particular hymn that you love and appreciate sung a cappella, um, uh, let, let me know, and I'll make sure that we have that for our, our Reformation Sunday. Uh, we'll definitely be singing A Mighty Fortress is Our God, which I know all of you know, so that one should go over well. Um, but just uh, if you know any special music that, or somebody who wants to be a part of that, let me know for the 29th. That's the last Sunday in October. Um, a few things. The, the Cleves had been planning to visit this weekend, but again, it didn't work out, and so we want to pray for them this morning just to for direction, and and as for all our families that way, direction in our lives, what we should be doing. Um, I have a note about October 24th. There's a suicide survivor who's speaking, sharing her uh, documentary, and then uh, question and answers afterwards. There's information on that, uh, the Hear Emma uh, thing that's in there. Uh, Our 125th anniversary is coming up pretty soon, another three and a half years, which will go by quick. Um, as far as planning is concerned. And so just be uh, keeping your ears and eyes open for that or if you have any ideas of things that would be good to do as part of that celebration. Um, I, don't think, I don't think we had it lined up for you to share this morning, but Chad will speak with us an announcement related to a cookbook project in the near future. So be aware of that. Uh, and then um, after the service today, kind of a last minute thing, if, uh, the email I sent out this week uh, focused on Israel. Uh, there's a really good video that just details in a short, the, probably the best video I've ever sa- found, shares just the facts, not opinions or feelings or, or uh, religion stuff thrown into it of the conflict that's going on over there, things to be aware of. And so um, I'm going to show that after the Sunday school opening this morning uh, in the sanctuary. So if you want to see that, it'll be about 25 minutes video-wise and then discussion. Any questions you have about Israel stuff, I don't want to really use that in our service time. And so we'll do it after the service today. Uh, if you're curious about any of the Israel stuff, definitely reach out to me and we can talk uh, personally, individually, or uh, we could have a group meeting at some point again um, after today even. Uh, so keep me posted on any, anything that you have in that. It's definitely a major world event and it will have um, consequences uh, well into the future. So um, with that, I think that's all of the announcements I have. I'm sure I'll remember 20 more later when I'm about ready to speak. So, any uh, prayer requests or announcements we should be made aware of? It's good to see Keith back with us. He keeps bouncing in and out on different travel trips, but uh, he had some testing done recently. He's, everything's checking out fine so far, and so pray for good news continuing with that. And John is with us, uh, Tammy's mom. He's recovering from his colon cancer surgery and looking great, John. So, uh, he, I, don't, I don't think he would recommend that diet plan uh, to lose weight, so not the best way to do it, but he's doing awesome, and the doctors did great. So, uh, All right, with that, I invite you to rise as you're able. We'll open with our call to worship this morning, a very familiar psalm, Psalm 23. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. <clears throat> He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. (laughs) 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. We continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy that you sent your Son that we might have peace with you. And so we thank you, Lord, that we can come into your presence with peace and thanksgiving. And Lord, we ask you that you, that peace would spill over from our relationship into our relationships in the world. And though peace will never come fully in the world until you return, may we have peace in our hearts as we worship you this morning. May you encourage us and uplift us that holds us through the week as we worship and praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Our opening hymn is number 206, When Morning Gilds the Skies. as you're able. We're going to continue with our confession of sins a little differently this morning. Rather than reciting what maybe becomes a habit, <clears throat> I'm going to begin us in a sense a little bit in prayer, directing us for personal confession um, in silence, not out loud, nothing to be ashamed or embarrassed of, but just confessing our hearts to God this morning similarly to we do that silence during our prayer time. And then when we do our Kyrie, so everything will be the same as far as your playing, Renee. But instead of saying, have mercy on us, I want us to try to remember to say, have mercy on me. And I want us to personalize our confession this morning, especially in light of our sermon message and text this morning. So I will lead us in a moment, silence for our confession of sins between you and God and your heart, and then Kyrie um, on me, and then I'll direct us at the Declaration of Grace. Heavenly Father, we come before you to confess that we are all sinners. Let us help us not to neglect and remember that. And 
And then though we find solace and comfort in you, Lord, we often overlook our sins daily. And so in this moment of silence, we cry out in our hearts and our minds to you, Lord, that you hear through your Holy Spirit the confession of what, where we have failed this week, maybe even this morning, Lord. Help us where we have uh, lied or committed adultery in our hearts or deceived people or, or coveted and desired other things or maybe even stole or murdered people, especially in our hearts and minds. Lord, we turn these things over to you as we confess to you personally from each and every one of our own hearts. Lord, we thank you for hearing this, our confession, as we continue with our Kyrie in our hymnal. O oh God, the Father in heaven, have mercy upon me. O oh God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy upon me. O oh God, the Holy Ghost, you comforter, have mercy upon me. I invite you to be seated for our Declaration of Grace because we're going to go to God's Word corporately as a family. And so if you have your Bible with you, if you grab your pew Bible from the, whoever the first one is in the pew Bible, Hebrews chapter 10, chapter, verses 22 and 23. And I'm going to read them if you wanted to read aloud uh, along with me. Uh, you're welcome to. Uh, the ESV will be what I'm reading from. But Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 and 23 will give us a moment to look that up in your Bibles. Uh, first one that has it in your pew Bible, if you want to shout out the page number to help anybody else, you can do that. 1194. 1194 in the pew Bible, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 and 23. I'll give us a moment yet to find that. Something we've been practicing with the confirmands, probably not enough, but just to make it a habit to look up verses in God's word, we we are beginning to maybe lose that knowledge and that habit because it's not done outside of Sunday morning oftentimes. So hear or read along or read out loud even. You're welcome to read aloud with me. But this is the declaration of God's grace to us personally. Hebrews 10, 22 and 23. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Amen. We continue our service with our hymn, Out of My Bondage, Sorrow and Night, number 482. I come to thee. 
out of my sickness into thy health, out of my need and into thy wealth, out of my sin and into thyself. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my shame, for failure and loss, Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into the glorious gate of thy cross. Jesus, I come to thee out of her sorrows into thy balm, out of life's storms and into thy calm, out of distress to jubilant psalm. Jesus, I come to thee. and arrogant pride. Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into thy blessed will to abide. Jesus, I come to thee out of myself to dwell in thy love out of despair to raptures above upward I rise on wings like a dove Jesus I come to thee out of the fear and dread of the tomb. Jesus, I come, Jesus, I come into the joy and light of thy home. Jesus, I come to thee out of the depths of ruin untold into thy peaceful sheltering fold. Ever thy glorious face to behold. Jesus, I come to thee. <clears throat> no, that was good. I was actually thinking, like, that put a really joyful smile in my heart and my face because I mean we're not just singing for the sake of singing we're not just following it was like the song was leading you <laughs> because we were in the song um, and I appreciate that because I, I don't you know when I pick a, I put time into picking the songs but I, I, I never truly know how God is going to use them and it's just uh, the content of the song I mean we were just into it and we were we were dragging the piano along and I, I thought that was great. And you did a great job of catching up with us, too. I would have been completely lost and flustered. Um, so thank you, Renee. Thank you to the congregation. Because I really, um, you know, pastors, uh, we have highs and we have a lot of lows. Because we know we get focused on burdens in the church and in the community and the world lately as well. Um, and, and I really cherish being able to sit up here and hear you sing and worship with you. Um, that really does lift me up and that encourages me each week. So don't take that for granted. It is such a blessing we have. I don't take it for granted. So uh, Our readings this morning, we begin in the Old Testament with Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. 
On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Here ends our Old Testament lesson from Isaiah. We continue with our lesson from the New Testament from the book of Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Here ends our New Testament lesson. We continue with our gospel, which I invite you to rise for in honor of God's word. Our gospel text this morning from Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to the man, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Here ends our gospel text. God be praised for his glad tidings. We continue with the confession of our faith this morning in the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as 
it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Congregation may be seated and invite the ushers to come forward for offering at this time. <clears throat> as you're able. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy holy spirit from Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the peace with you that allows us to come into your presence and bring also our requests. Um, sharing with you the things that we are thankful for, but also asking you for guidance and hope and truth. So we thank you, Lord, for the gifts that you've blessed us with, our time, our talent, the treasures, our children, our parents, our neighbors, our spouses, everything that you've blessed us with. We, we offer these things to you, Lord, as a holy sacrifice set apart for your purposes. And so help us, Lord. Give us wisdom in how best to use these gifts for your glory and for your name, that others may be brought into peace with you and be encouraged by you. Heavenly Father, we, we ask you especially to provide us guidance and wisdom in our lives and provide us purpose or help us to be clear in our identity as Christians and what that means to be followers of you first and foremost and let that guide us as, as fathers and mothers, as workers, as leaders in our communities, Lord. We ask you, Lord, be with the Cleve family and, and help them to see and understand what is your will for their lives and what, are, what is it you're calling them to do. Help them to be connected physically with a, a church body, Lord. If that's us, then draw them to us and, and remove any obstacles and barriers for them to, to be a part of their church family here. If it's elsewhere, make it clear to them and provide them wisdom and insight from you. But for all of our families, Lord, and give us that wisdom and identity of what are we to be doing how can we best, where should we be for you, Lord? Help us to understand and know why did we wake up today? For what purpose, what end? Who are we to encourage? Which children are we to be disciple makers of and leaders of and, and parents to and, and, and guiders in the community, Lord? What coworkers are we to lead into truth and wisdom and into holy living and encouragement? What bosses are we to witness to? What, all the different relationships we have, Lord, we ask you for wisdom and guidance in them. And to that end, Lord, the, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And so many of the places around us are, are lacking good workers, good and faithful workers to come and help. And in, in case of the county to keep us safe, we ask you, Lord, to provide uh, deputies and, and to provide leaders and to provide teachers and educators and to provide health care workers and to provide drivers of resources and goods, Lord. There are so many needs in our community 
that we ask you, Lord, help us to fill them with people who value you and value life and a good work ethic and who have good godly character that, that our community may be strong and it may be functional because of you at the core of it, Lord. And Lord, we ask for your wisdom and understanding of the current events in the world or surrounding the Middle East and your, your, the land, uh, the land that was set apart and holy until it rejected you, Lord. And so we ask for wisdom in, in how best to witness and evangelize to the, the, the Islamic people there that are waging war against the Jewish people there, both of which are fighting over worldly and earthly things but are lost because of their lack of Christ. We ask you, Lord, to be with the Christians who are boots on the grounds there, that they might be able to witness and share the truth of Jesus Christ and salvation through him, Lord. We ask your protection and your name be known throughout the world as you miraculously protect and guard that land that you set apart as a testimony and a remembrance stone for your good work in the past and in the present and in pointing to the future. And so give us understanding and wisdom and how best to support and lift up the work of your workers, your Christians, your disciples there, Lord. Lord, whatever else remains in our hearts and minds today, whatever personally we've confessed and need help with, Lord, help us in those things. We share these things with you, whatever we're thankful for. In this moment of silence, we speak again to you this morning in praise and thanksgiving. We thank you now and forever, Lord, that we have your ear, that you are always listening and available to us when we choose to come to you and sit at your feet. So we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Our next hymn is number 246, Savior again to thy dear name we raise. Pray with me as we begin. 
Heavenly Father, bless and guard us as we open your word this morning. Speak to us through it. Help us to understand your parable and your, the rest of the word that we're looking at this morning. And help us to see how does this apply in our lives. This whole service, Lord, may it speak to our hearts and our minds and produce action and fruit in our lives for the sake of you, Lord Jesus, and for the sake of our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh. <clears throat> Well, we're going to begin this morning in our Matthew passage, and then most, we'll round out most of it with our Philippians passage, and our benediction this morning we'll, we'll use from our Philippians passage as well. It's just a great, uh, a great passage. I've um, uh, been thinking of many things, trying to, to plan ahead, and so it's, it, it's always interesting to see how God interconnects different things, and then trying to figure out, okay, Lord, where do you want me to put things? And so my mind has been on Thanksgiving coming up. My mind has been on January coming up because I'm going to have my tonsils out at that time if everything goes well, and so I'm trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to fill those Sundays, and um, just different things running through my minds, and one of the things lately especially is thinking of what to do next year as a congregation as well, and, and <clears throat> I bring that up because this passage from Philippians 4 is, is uh, a good example of, uh, you know, we've, we've read through the Bible as a congregation the last couple of years, we've we focused on family worship for this year, and, and I haven't brought it up every Sunday, but I hope that as a family or a, a, in your house that you're, you're worshiping together, opening God's word, singing praises to him, and also praying to him. Those are the three things that are necessary for worship is in having relationship with God. And so I hope you're doing those in your homes. And so for this next year, the thinking especially of Israel where people were locked into their safe rooms while they were being attacked. And what do you have at that point? You may not have a Bible. You may not have the Word. What do you have hidden in your heart and in your mind? And so to that end, I think in the near future, maybe even beginning with Thanksgiving, I'm thinking of doing a hymn re regularly for a month or so that we might learn it and commit it into our hearts. And many of us have several hymns that way. But I want us to teach our children so that our children, when they're all alone or they're sitting in the classroom or they're traveling somewhere in their heart or out loud, they can sing whether it's the doxology that we sing all the time or whether it's turn your eyes upon Jesus um, or other good hymns. And so I want us to practice that. And then also I'm thinking of putting scripture in that we might repeat and this is where Philippians comes in because there's a wealth of ones here thinking of the one especially we'll use for the benediction which is verses uh, five through seven basically. That we might repeat these things for a few weeks and learn them and commit them like our students use in Sunday school. And this matters because it's kind of, in a sense, and this connects with our sermon as well, in that it's like when the king comes to, at the end of the parable, he says, well, there's a guy in, in the wedding feast. The guy has crashed the wedding party, and he's not wearing the garments of the feast. He, he doesn't have an invitation. He doesn't belong there. He has come in because the, everybody was welcomed in after the original invitation was gone. But part of being a part of the wedding is that you would wear the garments. You would be dressed appropriately. In the sense of speaking biblically, you would have be clothed in the Holy Spirit. And he was lacking that. And so he was thrown out of the wedding feast. And one way that we clothe ourselves in God is to remember his word in our hearts. And to sing his praises daily. So keep those things in mind. Uh, we're going to jump right to verse 5 in our Matthew 22 passage. I'm not going to reread the entire uh, parable or go step by step through it, but you know the, the main details. We're at the point now where the, the king has invited, he sent out the invitation to a select group. In this case, he's speaking directly to the Jews, to the Israel nation, the children of Abraham, when Jesus is sharing this parable. And the reality is throughout the history of the Jewish nation that we see in the Old Testament, over and over again we see what he's going to speak to in the parable in a second here. They paid no attention. They went off, one to his farm, another to his business. So they were ignoring God's call and God's kingdom because of their financial and power and desires for the world. They were distracted by the things of the world in those two instances, the farmers, the business people. They were more concerned with everyday affairs than they were the temple and God, and God being their king. So that's one aspect, and we see that in our culture today as well as Christians. This is human nature. 
This isn't just isolated to the Jews. We can't point to them and say, oh, well, I'm not like them, because we are. We get wrapped up in our business. We get wrapped up in our, our hobbies. We get wrapped up in our entertainment desires. And we get distracted by the world. So Christians today and, and people in America and around the world are equally guilty of those. And then you go further, while the rest... The rest of them seized his servants. They seized the prophets. They seized the, the priests of God. They treated them shamefully and they killed them. And we see that in the world today. We see that when there's persecution against a coach who wants to pray after, the, after uh, a football game. We see that in persecution which makes students think that they cannot pray in school even though they have every right to do so. And peer pressure prevents them from doing so most of the time. Same thing with teachers who can share their, their faith directly and, and show it. They just can't proselytize to the kids. We've neglected that information. But in the world outright, we see right now even the Jews themselves still being killed and massacred. But we see it with Christians as well in, in uh, African na Islamic nations and in uh, Southeast Asia in Islamic nations in Indonesia. Christians are killed and persecuted. Their homes are burnt. Pakistan and other, where, other places, there's direct persecution of God's people. And then the Jews who are God's people without the Savior are also, we're seeing that, shamefully killed and treated. But this isn't about others outside of the community. This is God's people doing that to God's people when he's sharing this parable. These are the ones that were invited who are treating the servants of the king shamefully. So these are the ones who persecuted and killed Jesus. These are the ones such as Paul who persecuted and killed the Christians. These are the ones who throughout Jewish history were persecuting one another. This is within their own homes. This would be the equivalent of Christians who are attacking other Christians just for the sake of not answering and following God's word or those who twist and distort it. And so what's the result of that? Verse 7, the king is angry. And so the king sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Jesus is speaking this parable oh, around, uh, around the year 30 AD or so. Within 40 years of his speaking this, this parable would become true and followed through on. Because historically, in AD 70, this is what happened. God allowed and used the troops of the world, the Roman Empire... And they came in and they destroyed those murderers and they burned their city. Jerusalem was destroyed and all the inhabitants of it were massacred. And the city was burned and torn down. And so in a sense this was a parable but it was also a prophetic vision of what was to come to God's people who rejected him. Who ignored the invitation. At the end of this passage the phrase many are called but few are chosen. It's our title today. God had put us his call to those people so that they would be a beacon to the world to come to him through them. And others could. But they kept it to themselves and they hid it and then they neglected that treasure. And so they were destroyed in the anger of the king after his mercy was spent. And so then now he has invited everyone else. And, and so anyone can come in. The church is open to anyone. This service is meant for Christians. We do things here that non-Christians would find foreign because the things that we do, the things we say, the things we sing, the word of God that we open is understandable to those who the Holy Spirit guides and directs. But the door is open for people to come and hear that they might also be saved and become a part of this kingdom of God on earth. But the reality is just like the wedding feast at the end, throughout the churches in America and the world, throughout the ones who even claim to be churches of God and not just churches of the world, there are many who are in there without their wedding garments, those who are clothed at the world rather than God. We think of it this way. God has set up this wedding feast analogy. This, this marriage analogy is all throughout Scripture. Matter of fact, the church is the bride of Christ. God's people will be his bride, and they will be wedded to him, and that union is special, and is, all the married couples especially appreciate and acknowledge that. But the reality is those who are invited by God oftentimes are courting the world. They're dating the world. They're going out and they're spending their time with worldly things and they're, they're learning about the world as if they're going to be married to the world one day. But when Jesus comes 
and transforms us through his word. And the Holy Spirit comes to us through baptism and, and makes us a new creation. We are born again. God commands us even to court Jesus, to be his disciple, to be his student. Are we doing that as Christians? The world certainly is not. So they're not on the table. This is not directed at them. This is directed at God's people. First and foremost, this parable, this passage, the context is directed to the Jew. To God's people at that time, those who were of Israel, those who were the ones striving with God. And then as the parable dictated, when they rejected it, he opened the doors to everyone. And, and Gentiles, those who did not know God, can now be grafted in. Through being born again, they are grafted into that kingdom. They become God's people, which is how we are here as God's people. It's how we can have peace through with God through Jesus Christ. And it's like we're engaged to Jesus. And so we are courting Jesus so that one day we'll be married to Jesus. And when you're courting your spouse or you're dating somebody, you desire to learn all about them. You desire to spend your time with them. That's how the Christian life is meant to be. And then one day, the Christian life is fulfilled when we die and are born again and married to Jesus forever. And we'll be a part of his family forever that way. The marriage at the end of time is what makes us chosen. It, it solidifies that ch choice. For many are called, but few actually attain that and are chosen. We often, when we think of chosen, we think of, oh, I select you for my team, and I select you for my team. But until you actually get over on my team, it's not, you aren't really chosen. You're just, it's just words. And until it's actually the game begins, that's when the chosenness has been confirmed. And so what you have right now is you have many in the world, you have many Christians even, who are courting the world, and then they, they jump from one date to another, and they're courting this, this entertainment thing, and they're courting this hobby, and they're courting this job and career, and they're courting this sinful desire, and they're courting this and that, and they're having many, many, many potential brides that they're courting. And then there's the hope that maybe the last minute they can court Jesus and be saved and be married to him. And that's true. He can transform at any time. But from the moment that he does that, you become a new creation. And the desire must be to court him. If you court the world, you're, you're committing adultery with all different kinds of people and places and things that take you away from him alone as God. And so then what happens is you end up becoming like, you become like the one who brings another date to the wedding that he is actually supposed to be in. Come into the, the wedding party the, and, and you're, you're lacking a garment. And that garment is Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. Many come, but not all of them will be chosen. God has sent forth that all might be chosen, but until they submit to him and are part of his kingdom and until... We find them in heaven one day because they were faithful and true and they confessed that Jesus was their Lord and they trusted in him for their salvation. They are not fulfilled in their chosenness until then. God desires that all would be chosen, that all would be at his side and it is them alone who choose not to be in the wedding garments. And so what does that look like for us? What can we focus our minds on? What should we commit to our hearts? Well, we turn to our Philippians passage for that. Finally, brothers, verse 8, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, these are the courting terms. These are the things we should seek of the relationship that we desire to have eternally. I'll repeat again, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. These are the things that should be running through our minds at all times. These are the things of the, the mind that is courting Jesus Christ. These are the things of the mind that is at that wedding feast for the sake of the bride and groom and not for the sake of the party or food or even the fellowship. These are the things that in our hearts and minds, if somebody takes us hostage, these are the things running through our minds because God is at peace with us even though the world is at war with us. 
And so what you have learned as we continue and received and heard and seen in me, and Paul speaking there, then that must, we, we must not just think about these things, but practice these things. And if we think and practice these things, the God of peace will be with you. You may be a Christian who maybe will be tortured someday or suffering in some way, or maybe your life is waning. The God of peace will be with you if you have been courting him. The God of peace does not come to those who are courting the world. He doesn't inject himself into other relationships. He commands you to come to his relationship and forsake the other relationships. May we be great at doing that. And if we can do that, what does that look like? Well, it looks like peace. What does peace look like? It looks like the end of our passage of Philippians as well. In any and every circumstance, Paul says he's learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, wet and drought, if you will. In any circumstance, he has learned, what is it? I can do all things through him, through Jesus Christ, who strengthens me. He's leaning on that relationship. He doesn't say, I can do all things through my Christian brothers who strengthen me, that God uses Christian brothers and sisters to strengthen us, but our hope is not in them. My hope is not in you. My hope is in God. I'm thankful for you, thankful for my wife, but my hope is in Jesus to give me the strength when those things fail. If the church burns down, my hope is in Jesus, not the building. As some of you pass away, my hope is not in you. I mourn with you. I, I grieve more and more as I get to know you deeper and deeper. But my hope is not in you or my relationship with you. If my spouse passes away, if my kids are taken in an accident or death of some nature, or even if they're lost to the kingdom and they chase after the world, I will mourn, I will lament, but my hope is in Christ who strengthens me. I can be strong and courageous. I can be bold and convicted alone because of Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit within me. It certainly isn't because of my giftedness in any area of life. It's not because of the strength I physically have. It's not because of any intelligence or wisdom that I have apart from God. It is solely because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And as I close, one day he will return. And all of God's people, from our Isaiah passage, our Isaiah's passage is speaking of the feast that we will one day have, of the wedding feast. And the very last part is speaking of the day when the Lord will return. And it will be said on that day, Isaiah says, and this is what all of God's people will say and what they should be able to say now in their hearts as well. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. We have waited for him like we waited when we were courting our bride or our groom. We have waited for him when we wanted to learn about them because we loved them and we desired to spend our life with them. And now we wait for the Lord. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation because that's what marriage with him brings. Marriage with the world brings death, destruction, decay, pain, suffering. But marriage to God, marriage to Jesus in our heart, in our minds, in our soul brings life everlasting. Take that to heart today as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your teaching. We thank you for your parables even that were foreshadowing of what you were intending to allow in the world. And now we look back and we see another way that you fulfilled your truth and scripture. Lord, we look in the past to see your work and to see your faithfulness. And that allows us to trust you today. And we look to the future not with anxiety or fear, but with hope everlasting. And no matter what suffering befalls us as the world events begin to spiral out of control as you remove yourself and remove your grace, we know that we still have your grace because we are in relationship with you. And we know that through Jesus Christ, you will strengthen us and keep us. And you will guard our eternity, our souls, no matter how many in painful things get inflicted upon us or how much we may have to suffer or work hard. Our hope is not in this world, it is in the next. And we thank you for that, Lord. 
May we celebrate that every moment we wake up and spend our time throughout the day. In Jesus' name, amen. Our service continues with hymn 555, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. Time to channel your inner Johnny Cash. the skies and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us work of all his wondrous love and care. And the rolling light is in the green. And the roll is called up yonder. I'll be there. Up yonder, and the roll is called up yonder, and the roll is called up yonder, and the roll is called up yonder. I'll be there. Invite you to rise as you're able. We'll close in the Lord's prayer as Jesus taught us. We pray to the Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our benediction this morning, a good word from God to us is from Philippians 4. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Go now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.
Go in peace and serve the Lord. Uh, remember, I'll have an Israel video in here after Sunday school opener. <laughs>